Welcome, welcome home. Good to see all of you today. Pastor Kyle is... Uh, He's off today having some family time, so we wish him well and hope they have a good time together. But um, just a couple of of quick things. Um, That that Dave Ramsey live event that you just just saw the video of that, um, understand that that what Dave Ramsey does and the reason that we're we're kind of advertising that and inviting people to that isn't isn't just so people can get rich. It's, It's just so we can be good stewards of what God's given us, right? And Dave Ramsey, he certainly has some great principles that can help us do that. But um, I also want to tell you about the All-Star Marriage Conference. Um, Sarah and I will be leading this. It's, it's Friday and Saturday, November 10th and 11th, and it starts about 5 o'clock with supper that Friday. It'll go till about 9.30 or so, and then it'll start about 8.30 Saturday morning and go till mid-afternoon, around 3.30-ish. So uh, it is open to any couples, no matter how long you've been married, um, and uh, it's, just, it's $25 a couple. It's really inexpensive. That just that just covers food and materials. And so we hope you can come. There's a sign-up sheet in the lobby. Be sure you sign up. As soon as you know that you can come, sign up because space is limited. Just because of how it's formatted, uh, we, we have to limit the space. So uh, hopefully you can come to that, and uh, we'll, we'll have a lot of fun there. But uh, this morning, we continue our series called Written in Stone. We've been looking at the Ten Commandments, which are, are ten non-negotiable things that we need to do, that anybody needs to do if they want to love God and love people. Um, That's what God's desire for his people has always been. Loving God and loving people isn't just a New Testament thing. Uh, Even the Ten Commandments reflect that. The first four commandments are about loving God. The last six commandments are about loving people. And so uh, that's where we are today. Today we come to the Eighth Commandment. And uh, before we really jump into this, I need to make a confession. It's confession time, okay? Confession time from when I was a little kid. I don't, need, I don't remember how old I was, but uh, there was a cookie company that had just come out with these new soft chocolate chip cookies. And instead of just like mailing out a flyer to everybody... They, at, they, would ne- they would never do that in this day and age. They actually mailed out these little sample packs of cookies. And so I guess it was during the summertime, my friends and I were playing, and, and uh, we, we figured out that, that every mailbox on our street <laughs> had a package of cookies in them. Now, I'm pretty sure that taking something from a mailbox is a federal offense, and I don't know if there's a statute of limitations on that, so I'm not saying another word. (laughs) Except to say that, yes, I have broken the Eighth Commandment. You must not steal. All right? You must not steal. This is a pretty pretty straightforward commandment, just like most of the commandments are. I mean, it's not really complicated. I mean, I I grew up in Texas. Let's put this in redneck terms. Don't take what ain't yours, all right? Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. But let's let's just kind of unpack this a little bit. Uh, You must not steal. First of all, my first question is, um, why is stealing such a big deal to God? Why is taking something from somebody else, taking something that doesn't belong to us, why is that so offensive to God? Well, let me offer you a couple of of reasons. Uh, First of all, because God owns everything. And if God owns everything, then it's his right to give and it's his right to take away. The Bible says that too. Um, The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Why? Because he owns everything. He either created it or he created us with the ability to create it. So it all belongs to him. In fact, Psalm, uh, Psalm 24 says this, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it the world and all who live in it. Everything belongs to God. So when I steal something from somebody else, it's kind of in a way like stealing from God because it's really ultimately his stuff. But here's the second reason that stealing is so offensive to God. And and really, I think this is the biggest thing. Because stealing undermines and destroys our relationships. You see, this commandment really isn't about stuff. It's not about property. It's really not about money or or things or possessions. This commandment, like all the commandments, is really about relationships. 
See, God cares more about our relationships with each other than he cares about our stuff. In fact, most of the cultures uh, in that, you know, most of the ancient cultures in that part of the world in that day, if you were caught stealing, the penalty was you were put to death. You were executed for stealing. Not with the Israelites. See, the Ten Commandments, they're part of the the greater Old Testament law. They're just a small part of the greater Old Testament law. And the Old Testament law said when you steal from somebody, it's not that you are to be executed. Most of the time it says if you steal from somebody, you have to make restitution. That means you pay back what you stole. In fact, usually it says pay back double what you stole. Now, why would God do that? Why would God not say, okay, if you steal, then, then you need to die? Why would he instead say, if you steal, pay it back and then some? He says that because his desire is for us to have good relationships with each other. And so he says, you know what, human life, human relationships are more important to me than stuff and possessions. So if you steal from somebody, just go make it right and try to heal that relationship that you damaged when you stole. This is about relationships, folks. And so... By this point, maybe you're thinking that, um, you know, stealing money, stealing property uh, isn't really a temptation for me. I've never really stolen anything. I've never stolen cookies out of a mailbox, you might be saying to yourself. So maybe this commandment doesn't really apply to me. Let's widen the net a little bit. You know, the last two weeks, we talked about murder and adultery. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. And as Pastor Kyle said in in both of those messages, you don't have to actually kill somebody in order to commit the sin of murder. You don't actually have to sleep with somebody to commit the sin of adultery. There are other ways that we can break those commandments according to what Jesus says in the New Testament. Well, in the same way, you don't actually have to steal something tangible or steal some possession in order to break the Eighth Commandment. So let's talk about some other ways that we break this commandment, some other ways that we steal from people. First of all, we can steal a person's good name and reputation through gossip. Um, Several years ago, I was on the board of a nonprofit organization, and and for a little while, I was the president of the board. And, And during that time, some really bad stuff happened, and we had to make some really difficult decisions And about a a year or so after that, some people, in fact, some people who were even part of that decision decided they didn't like the decisions that we made then and and put all the blame at at my feet. And I found out they were were telling people stuff around town where we were at at the time. And uh, they were telling lies, actually, about me around town. And uh, to the point that a, a guy in our church, he was talking to this lady and he invited her to come to our church, and she actually said to him, um, I can't go to your church with Adam as the pastor there, because when he was with this organization, he did this. And fortunately, the guy in our church said, that really doesn't sound like Adam, and, and he asked me about it, and I said, no, that, that didn't happen at all. And so, you know, we kind of went through this, and it, it, was, it made me mad, and it hurt, and I, and I told Sarah, I said, I try so hard to keep a good name and a good reputation, not just for our sake, but for the sake of our church. And these people are saying stuff that isn't even true, and now it's it's even affected our church, because here's a lady who won't come because of it. Now, God obviously saw us through that, but that's a painful thing. You can steal a person's good name, and you can steal a person's good reputation by telling stories you shouldn't be telling. And one thing we need to be careful of in the church is sometimes we're good at, at disguising gossip as prayer requests, aren't we? Hey, I heard that this person did this. We better pray for that person. Be careful, folks. Be careful with that gossip. It can, it can steal a person's good name and, and, uh, and reputation. Second thing is you can steal a person's purity or integrity by, by leading them or pressuring them into sin and temptation. Uh, let me say something. Uh, any teenagers in the room or single people of any age, listen closely. 
if somebody tries, if you're, if you're dating somebody and they try to lead you into something that is going to steal your purity before God, you need to find somebody else. Don't let anybody steal your purity, your righteousness before God, and make sure that you're not on the other side of that. Make sure that you are not trying to lead somebody into temptation or sin in a way that's going to steal their purity before God from them. This is a big one. Be careful with that. Third thing is, you can steal a person's sense of peace and joy by refusing to be reconciled with them. It, uh, it breaks my heart when I hear stories of, of uh, you know, siblings who aren't talking to each other or adult kids who aren't talking to their parents or parents who aren't talking to their kids. Um, you know, when somebody tells those stories to you, you can just see the pain, Right? Because God, God d- designed us to be different. He designed us to have relationships that, that, bring, that bring us joy and, and goodness and happiness and all of those things. It's one thing if you have tried to reconcile the relationship. You know, the Bible says, as far as it depends on you, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. In other words, do your part. But know that you can't control what the other person does. So, that, so that's one thing. If you've tried, if you've made an effort, if you've done everything you can do to try to reconcile that relationship and they refuse, that's one thing. But make sure that you are not the one who is refusing to be reconciled. Because when we do that, we're, we're stealing, in a sense, from that person. We're stealing from them the, the joy and the peace that God wants our relationships to bring us. So be careful with that. Be reconciled with one another. We'll talk more, a little bit more about that one in a minute. Uh, The second, or the the fourth one, I guess, is um, you can steal an opportunity for someone because of your own selfishness. Let me give you a a kind of a hypothetical example of that. Um, but, But let me set it up first. Sarah and I had our 20th anniversary in August. And uh, a few days before our actual anniversary, we were able to go out on a date. Somebody anonymously bought our supper from Jim's. So if you're in this room, thank you very much. I have no idea who it was. But on our actual anniversary, we weren't even in the same state. Um, it, we were still transitioning, trying to get them here. You know, if you're new today, I've been here since January. And Sarah and the boys, they stayed in southern Missouri to finish out the school year because Sarah's a teacher, and so uh, it was a hard transition getting them here. And so on the day of our anniversary, we weren't even in the same state. We talked on the phone a couple times during the day, and I think we fought even on the phone, so it was not a good 20th anniversary. All right, so I began thinking pretty, pretty soon after that, all right, we've got to do something big for our 25th. I mean, our fifth anniversary, we, we took a trip and did something big, our 10th. We didn't. Our 15th, we did. Our 20th was awful. So our 25th has to be something really good, right? So here's the hypothetical situation. That was a long setup. Um, What if Sarah and I were talking about our 25th anniversary, and Sarah said, I want to go to Hawaii. I've always wanted to go there. I'd love to do it. That would be a blast. That would make me so happy. Let's go to Hawaii for our 25th anniversary. And let's say that that I said... um, no, let's go to the mountains. Let's go camping. Let's do some fishing out in Colorado or something like that. And let's say that we went back and forth. And, and I mean, Sarah likes Colorado too, and she would like that. But what if she really wanted to go to Hawaii, but she finally just got tired and, of, of me arguing and just said, okay, fine. All right, now guys, when your wife says fine, it's not fine, okay? You don't have to go to the marriage conference for that. That's free. Okay, so let's just say Sarah said fine, and we went to Colorado, and we're sitting around the campfire, and there's a tent over there, and we're we're beside a stream, and we're hoping bears don't eat us or something, I don't know, and and what if Sarah was sitting there thinking, this is nice, but I really wish we were in Hawaii. (laughs) 
in this scenario, I would have stolen something from Sarah, wouldn't I? I would have stolen from her an experience, something that would have made her really happy just because of my own selfishness and insisting on my own way. Now, I know nobody else in here has ever done that. Okay, every one of us in here has done that, haven't we? If we're really honest. Don't let your own selfishness cause you to rob somebody else of something that would make them happy. Be careful with that. Fifth thing, you can rob your loved ones of a joy-filled relationship. Honestly, sometimes just by being a jerk too often. You know, now all of us are a jerk sometimes. But as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about in the context of our families, if we're really honest, we're, we're bigger jerks to our close to the people who are closest to us than we are to anybody else, aren't we? I will be the first to admit that I've said things to my wife and kids that I would never say to anybody else. I have talked to them in a tone of voice that I would never use with anybody else. It shouldn't be that way, folks. It's the people we're closest to that, that, that we're often the biggest jerks to. And, and when we're that way... We're stealing something from them. Remember, God created us to be in relationship with each other, and he created us to, to, gain, to gain joy and happiness from those relationships. But if I'm a jerk to my wife all the time, I'm stealing from her the joy of a happy, healthy marriage. If I'm a jerk to my kids all the time, then I'm stealing from them a, a happy, healthy childhood. You say, okay, well, how do I not be a jerk all the time? Start with the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control. Practice those things, and you won't be a jerk to your family. And you won't steal from them the joy of a good relationship with you. So that's another thing to be careful about. The last one is, is just something really kind of, kind of practical. Um, you know, you can steal from your boss. You can steal from your place of employment just by being less than a dependable, conscientious worker. Um, well, the Bible tells us that even when we're at work, work as if we're working for God and not somebody else. Work as if God is your boss, not not your boss. And if you'll do that, if you'll approach your job with the mindset of, I'm not going to just do this to make money. I'm not going to just do this uh, to put a roof over my head. I'm going I'm to approach this job in a way that brings honor to God. I'm going to use my job in some way that will bring honor to God. If you'll do that, you'll never steal anything from, from your job, whether that be money or time or productivity or whatever. So those are some ways that we steal from people, uh, what I would call some intangible ways. They don't involve stealing money or property, but they involve stealing. And when you look at that list and you look at the things up there, uh, if we're really honest, every person in this room, if we take that into account, has stolen something from somebody somewhere along the line. And every person in this room, when you take those things into account, has had something stolen from you. So what's our takeaway then? Well, I have three things if you're the offender. If you are the one stealing, three things to do if you're the offender. And one thing to do if you're the victim. Let's start if you're the offender. Uh, the first thing is stop it, <laughs> right? That's pretty simple. If you're stealing something from somebody, whether it's a, something tangible or something intangible, stop it. Stop. Paul says, he who has been stealing must steal no longer. Again, that's pretty straightforward, isn't it? Stop. Stop doing it. And you say, well, uh, how do you stop doing it? Sometimes just saying stop, that's easier said than done. So the second thing is protect your integrity. Protect your integrity. Integrity is what you do when nobody's looking. It's easy to do the right thing when somebody's looking over your shoulder. But what do you do when nobody's looking? That's integrity. 
And the thing about integrity is um, when I allow a, a small crack in my integrity, that usually leads to bigger cracks in my integrity, which leads to bigger cracks in my integrity. Some of you remember, some of you are old enough to remember, uh, back in the early 2000s, there was a, uh, it, it, seemed like, it seemed like every week there was another story in the news about a, a corporate scandal, a CEO or a CFO who, who uh, just swindled people out of a bunch of money. And, and these stories just kept coming to light and coming to light. And the biggest one at that time was a company called Enron. Anybody remember Enron? It's a Houston-based company. And, uh, and, and their, their CEO, he had, just, he had swindled shareholders and employees out of millions and millions of dollars. And not long after that, Sarah and I were at our neighbor's house. They were having a block party, and we, we were just, there was a big group of us on the back porch just hanging out, eating some food. And uh, the, the subject of Enron came up. And so somebody looked at me and said, Adam, uh, you're a pastor. That always makes me kind of nervous when people start off that way. You know, pastors have the answers to everything, allegedly. I said, Adam, you're a pastor. How does, how does somebody get to, to this point where they can steal, where they can actually look themselves in the mirror while they're stealing millions and millions of dollars from thousands of people? How does a person get to that point? And I said, well, here's my guess. I bet you if you asked all of those guys who have been in the news... I bet you if you asked them the question, when you were in college or when you were starting off in your career or starting off at this company, did you set out to steal millions of dollars from people? Was that your plan all along? I bet you they would say no. And I bet you if they were really honest, they would probably even say, I don't even know how I got to this point. See, I think it probably started way back here in college or when they were starting out and they made little compromises in their integrity. I'm going to skim a little off the top here. I'm going to do this little thing over there. And then that led, that led to something bigger. And that led to a bigger compromise and a bigger compromise until here they are stealing millions and millions of dollars from people. Protect your integrity. If you're okay skimming a little off the top at work, if you're okay with skimming a little off the top on your taxes, if you're okay skimming a little off the top over here or over there, be careful. Because those little compromises lead to bigger ones. Protect your integrity. Be careful with those little compromises. The third thing is practice generosity. Say that with me. Practice generosity. You know what I think the opposite of stealing is? Generosity. Stealing is about taking. Stealing is selfish. Stealing says, I want that and I'm going to go take it. Generosity says... I want you to have this, and I'm going to give it to you. One is completely selfish. The other is completely selfless. You want to keep yourself from going down the road of stealing, no matter whether you're talking about tangible things or intangible things. Practice selfless generosity. Put other people's needs ahead of your own. Put other people's desires ahead of your own. Put other people's well-being ahead of your own. If you'll do that, those things on the screen, you'll never do those things. Practice generosity and you will never steal anything from anybody. In fact, Paul says it, he says it this way. Read these words with me. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. 
Put those words into practice and you will never steal anything from anybody. Practice generosity. Be a giving person. So if you're the offender, one, stop doing it. Two, protect your integrity. Three, practice generosity. Now what if you're the victim? I have one thing to do if you're the victim. Anybody want to guess what it is? Forgive. Forgive. You already knew I was going to say that. Man, what a preacher, Sunday school, churchy thing to say. Well, (laughs) it's the truth, folks. Forgive. When somebody has stolen from you, especially if what they've stolen is something material or tangible, it's it's not worth holding a grudge over, folks. I've seen more siblings than I want to than I than I want to admit who at one time seemed to have a, a good peaceful relationship but then mom and dad died and they started fussing over who was going to get what and accusing each other of stealing and it ruined their relationships and that's so tragic it's not worth that folks it's not worth it practice forgiveness When somebody has stolen something from you, or even when you just think somebody has stolen something from you. In fact, in our our church that we came from, um, there was a a family that started attending our church. And years before that, uh, the guy had had this really bitter property dispute with his neighbor. One of them, I don't remember all the details, one of them had put up a fence, and the other was accusing him of stealing his property, that's on my side of the fence, no, or on my side of the property, no, that's on mine, and it was this really big, nasty, bitter thing, basically with both of them accusing the other of stealing property. And so you fast forward a few years, and this, the, this, the one family started attending our church, and uh, about a year after that, the other guy showed up to visit our church, having no idea that this guy was, you know, attended there. And the day that this other guy showed up to visit our church, we were having communion. And instead of having everybody come up to receive the elements, we had ushers distribute the elements. And the the first guy who started attending our church, he was an usher that day. And guess whose section this other guy sat in? He had to serve communion to this guy who he had had this bitter and and had maintained this bitter spirit towards. And God convicted his heart immediately. He told me his hands were trembling when he handed the guy the tray. And before the week was out, he met with the guy. And he said, I want you to know I forgive you for all that stuff back then, and I hope you can forgive me. Now, I don't think those guys became buddy-buddies after that, but they were able to worship next to each other in the same sanctuary. They were able to sit with each other in a room and have a Bible study without getting bitter and angry over what had happened years before. You know why? Because through God's power, through God's love and God's spirit, they were both able to say, relationship is more important than stuff. God loves that kind of thing. Let me tell you, that kind of thing brings joy to God's heart. When we can set aside an offense, whether it's real or imagined, when we can set aside an offense and say, I forgive you, will you forgive me? That brings joy to God's heart. Whatever somebody has stolen from you, whether it's something tangible or whether it's something intangible, ask God to help you through his Holy Spirit to get to a place where you can say, you know what, I forgive. I'm going to let it go. I think a week or two ago, Pastor Kyle sang the song, Let It Go for You, and I'm not going to do that. You're welcome. Let go. Let go of that right to be angry. Let go of that right to, be, to get even. 
and forgive. Here's the thing. If God, um, if God cares more about our relationships than he cares about our possessions, then we should too. We should too. So, when you consider all the things that, that we've talked about, when you consider all of the intangible ways that we can steal from each other, um, there, there's really no other conclusion but to say, in light of that, we're all guilty of stealing something from somebody. And all of us have had something stolen from us. And so, let me just close with a couple questions. For whatever you may have stolen from somebody else, whether it's something tangible or something intangible, for whatever you may have stolen from somebody else, have you repented of that? Repent means to change directions, to to walk in the opposite direction. Have you repented? Have you asked their forgiveness? Have Have you tried to do something to make it right and mend that relationship? If you haven't, what would it look like if you did? What would it look like if you went to that person in humility and said, I know I stole something from you when I did this. I know I stole something from you when I said that. And I'm sorry. Or if the person is dead, maybe they're not even here, maybe they're not even living anymore and you can't have that conversation. What would happen if you just wrote a letter to them as if they were still alive and said, I messed up and I'm sorry. On the other side of it, for whatever somebody may have stolen from you, either tangible or intangible, Have you forgiven them? Have you made the choice? Have you prayed, God, help me not to hold this against them anymore. Help me not to have a bitter heart towards them. Help me to let go of my right to stay angry with them for the rest of my life. If you haven't done that, what would it look like if you did? Would you stand with us? I don't know how you want to respond to this today. I don't know what God might be speaking to your heart. I would just say, be obedient to whatever he's he's laying on your heart right now. If you want to come pray about something, if if you want to leave this sanctuary right now and go make a phone call that you really feel like you need to make, whatever it is, Just be obedient to what he's telling you and speaking to your heart right now. Let's continue to worship him a little longer. Christ is enough.
Christ is enough, that song says. Jesus, you are all I need. When Jesus is all you need, you won't need to take anything from anybody else because you already have all you need. Here's the thing. If you have Jesus, you already have all you need. God, help us to be aware of that. Help us to know in our heart of hearts that you, Jesus, are all we need. I don't need another thing in my life because I have you. 
Father in heaven, help us, help every person in this room to get to that point where you really are all we need, all of our contentment, all of our satisfaction in life, all of our joy and peace and everything comes from you. Forgive us, Father, when we're selfish. Forgive us when we, when we steal things from other people, whether that's tangible or intangible things. And God, give us the strength, the courage to forgive when we're on the other side of it. Make us more like Jesus. We love you. We trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Have a blessed, blessed day.